So please welcome to the stage, Wayne Morris. Morning, everybody. Um, can I just have a quick show of hands? Who, who has got the event app on their device this morning? Okay, cool, great. Um, if you haven't and you're still trying to download it, please give it a go. There's the URL, or just go to any app store, search for guidebook, download guidebook, then search for EventX, and in there you'll, you'll find the app. Um, <coughs> so thanks for having me. Uh, Havanas, thanks for inviting us. Uh, it's, it's our first time, my first time in, in Bulgaria. I woke up this morning, saw these beautiful mountains. Uh, really, really pleased to be here. So um, hopefully this next hour will be of real value to you. My, um, my, my goal, so, so firstly, apologies. There is guidebook literally everywhere. You cannot avoid us. Thanks, Avanas. I put on this T-shirt thinking, well, I don't know what I was thinking. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't thinking this anyway. So um, I'm pretty sure you know where, I, where I'm from. So I'm going to keep the guidebook stuff to maybe like two or three slides, and that is it. Um, the goal of this is really to try and empower you to make better decisions when it comes to making a decision around this whole event app space, just generally speaking. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, um, I've spent the whole of my career taking disruptive, that is new technologies to market that people have never heard of. Um, and uh, one of the things that really pains me is when people are trying to uh, utilize technology in their organizations for the very first time, but they really don't know where to turn. And that puts them at the mercy of sales guys. Uh, and when you're at the mercy of sales guys, as a buyer, you're in a pretty weak position. So what I want to do um, through this next hour is try and strengthen your position as the event planner, as the, uh, as, as the buyer, so that you're in a much stronger position to make the decision that works for you and your organization. So I'm going to give that a go in, in the next hour, and, and uh, you can tell me how I get on. A little bit about guidebook. Uh, these three guys here, Jeff, Kevin, Peter, childhood friends, born and bred in Silicon Valley, um, love going to events, conferences. Um, they um, specifically, uh, Kevin and Peter, are, are gamers, so they enjoy playing on computer games, and they were going to um, gaming conferences uh, in the United States. And what they were finding was that these events were amazing. However, they were leaving with this feeling that only 25% of what was going on at those events were they able to really interact with. So just like um, Silicon Valley kids do, they were 25 when they found this, this problem, they're now 29. They didn't whinge about it, they just went and created a solution, and that solution is Guidebook. We have a few offices. Uh, we have an office here, uh, in fact two here uh, in San Francisco, one in Palo Alto, which is in Silicon Valley, and one uh, in, in downtown San Francisco. In fact, our second office was, was here. Anyone guess where that might be? Seoul in South Korea, that was our second office. Our third office was here. Anyone gets this, I'll build you a fully branded app for free. Anyone? This is it, Raleigh in North Carolina. And you'll all get this one. This is our latest office, it is in London. And we opened this office 10 months ago. Um, my role in the business is uh, I sit on the executive leadership team. My responsibility is to grow Guidebook internationally. So we've done a great job in the United States. We've started uh, in Asia, uh, but we, we, o we, haven't, we hadn't entered Europe until 10 months ago. In those 10 months, we've acquired quite a lot of clients. We've acquired about 100 clients. Here's a selection of them. Globally, we have about 1,200 paying customers. Uh, and as Alan mentioned, um, we, we have somewhere in the region of about 20 to 25,000 events on our platform. So for those of you that have the app on their device, I'm going to try a live poll with you. Um, here are some directions about how to get there. So if you have your app, um, please go to the EventX app. And then in the top right-hand corner, you'll see Program. I'm just going to do that now in front of you. When you click on Program, go to this session. So sorry, click on full program and then go to this session where there's a tick next to it there, paper to mobile. And then when you get to the details, scroll to the very bottom 
and you'll see live poll for paper to mobile. If you click on that, it should take you to a web link which will then say poll inactive. Victor, have you managed to do that? If you no? Wi Fi is not. Is everyone having trouble with Wi Fi? Yeah, everyone has trouble with Wi Fi. Okay, so let's ditch the poll. Here you go, plan B. Thankfully, I have a plan B. I want to get some idea for um, how many, uh, some idea of what we've got in the audience. I want to get some idea of how many events you organize in the year. Can I have a show of hands for people that just don't organize events? Okay, so there's a few that don't organize events at all. Um, how many of you organize between one and five events in a year? Okay, great. Between six and ten? Okay. And more than ten? Okay, great. So the majority is more than ten. That's interesting. Uh, second was one to five, for those of you that um, uh, aren't able to see. And zero was the smallest amount, and six to ten was in between. What's your largest event? Um, can I have a show of hands for people that don't organize events for more than 50 people? Bet between 50 and 100 people? Okay, so a few of you. Between 100 and 250? Okay, a few more of you. Um, between 250 and 1,000? Okay, and more than 1,000? Okay, that's a really nice spread. How many of you at any of these events that you have organized have deployed an app? Okay, cool. So hardly any of you. Great, kind of. So um, I'm more than happy for any of you to challenge me on this, but I'm just about to come out with a statement that you can challenge me with, um, about over a beer. But um, where we're at in terms of market evolution is really at the front end of this curve. Um, when new technology comes to market, it takes a while to, 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 to gain momentum. Um, and I've spent all of my time in, in my working life helping businesses start out, get beyond this chasm, I'll talk about that in a second, and then to get real traction and to grow. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples as I go through this. Um, <clears throat> what happens at this front end is that there's lots of hype. People get very excited because there's new stuff out there um, and people want to use it. Um, and there's all sorts of ideas about how it can be deployed, but there's an awful lot of disappointment that happens as well. Uh, and you'll find that a lot of technologies fall into this gap, which is, which is known as the chasm. Now, um, in terms of event apps, we haven't reached that chasm yet. We're still at this front end here. Now, lots of people will try to argue that we're beyond that, but just my opinion, uh, for what it's worth, we're, we're, we're not there yet. And for you as buyers, there's a challenge there. The challenge is, is that if we're not before this chasm where lots of technologies fall into and es essentially die, um, then you might be buying into one of those technologies that dies, and that's going to cause you problems as, as an organization. So the whole focus for, for these next 45 minutes is to try and help you pick technologies that are going to evolve beyond that chasm. There are five key questions that I'm going to address. So firstly, your strategy, do we need an event app at all? I'm going to spend more time on the front end stuff, mainly because I think most people ignore this front end stuff. And if you get the front end stuff, the strategy, the features, and the vendor right, pretty much everything else flows. The biggest mistake that people make is that they don't get that first piece right. So I'm, going to I'm not going to apologize. I'm going to spend more time on that front end piece than I am the other bits and pieces. I'm going to go on to features. We're going to talk about vendors. We're going to talk about how we get adoption. And then we're going to talk a little bit about data. So firstly, do we need an app? Um, we're going to look at organizational culture. So what is the culture of your organization? Or, or in fact, what's your aspirational culture? Where is it that you want to get to? And, and you know, does, does an event app really apply to my event? So here are some statements that I, that I kind of commonly hear or at least sense um, in some organizations. So you can read them. I, I just know what our attendees want. We are experts at these events. At events, we want people talking, not on their phones. No paper program. There's no way our audience would accept that. And no amount of data will override my gut feel. I know best. So if you sense that those kinds of statements, attitudes exist within your organization, you have to ask yourself a really, really important question. And that question is, if it's you that has, that's driving those, uh, those attitudes, then are you prepared to evolve and are you prepared to change that? If it's not you, 
do you have the energy, the power, the influence to change that in your organization? Because quite frankly, if this is embedded in your organization, then please do not try to deploy any event app anywhere in the world. It's not worth it. Stop now, go home, do something else. I want to give you an example in a different industry of where I've seen this, of where I've seen this happening. I assume all of you are aware of these two brands, British Airways and EasyJet. Um, so I'm going to rewind about 11, 12 years. So um, in my mid-20s, uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, I was hired to uh, help launch a business into Europe uh, that was um, that had access to really valuable uh, web intelligence. Um, the business was called Hitwise. It was acquired by Experian um, a few years ago for, for, for a, a decent amount of money. Um, and what Hitwise were doing was disruptive technology. What they were doing was they were able to get access to internet service provider data, and they were able to aggregate that data to tell us what was happening online. Now today, fast forward a decade, this is common. But if you rewind over 10 years ago, this was not common. This was completely new. Um, and I was really intrigued by this, by this data, and I thought the business had a really good opportunity to grow and expand, which eventually it did. One of the things that I picked out, um, and one of the sectors I wanted to focus on, was the airline industry. Um, I took a very close look. I mapped out all of the key airlines across Europe, and then I mapped against them the smaller ones, the ones that were coming through, these internet startups that were really doing everything online and not using the traditional methods. Um, and I wanted to see what was happening, just generally in that space. If you map the two against each other, British Airways and EasyJet, back in 2002, 2003, you wouldn't have really been able to get them on the same graph because the web traffic for British Airways was miles ahead of EasyJet. EasyJet was all the way down here. And there was nothing meaningful about the graph if you mapped their web traffic visits over time. EasyJet was pretty much flat. But then what I did is I focused in on EasyJet and had a very quick look through my data as to what was actually happening with their, with their graph. And what I noticed was that the graph was growing exponentially. You couldn't see it on the, on the main graph, but if you focus just on, just on EasyJet, their traffic was growing exponentially. It was growing at a rate that was just phenomenal. It was really, really clear that they were doing something very, very smart. So I thought, with this new disruptive technology, no one else can see this but me. I am going to go to British Airways and tell them what's happening. And I'm going to advise them that if they buy into my technology, they will be able to determine some of the strategies that EasyJet are using, which will then help them arrest some of their market share decline. Because if you looked at what's happening with British Airways, they were pretty much flat. In a growing market, they were pretty much flat, which meant they were, that they were seeing a decline. New technology being presented to a traditional business um, that they'd never seen before. So after many phone calls, many emails, I got in front of a team of people at British Airways. Um, I showed them that top level graph and I said, if you look at the graph as it is, it doesn't tell you anything, but if you look and focus on EasyJet, you can see exponential growth, which you, British Airways, don't have, but they do have. And if you follow this through through a number of years, what will happen is they will begin to eat into your market share and you'll feel it. What do you think the response was I got from British Airways? They were not interested. Not interested. Thanks, Wayne. Cheers for coming. Off you go. So uh, I said, well, well, wait a minute. I'm not, uh, why are you not interested? And they said things like, we've been running this airline for decades. We know what's best. We know our customers. All this stuff that I hear day in, day out in many other industries. But what about the data? What about this data? This is not my opinion. This is not your opinion. This is millions of people telling you what they're doing laid out in front of you. What about the data? They ummed and aahed for about three seconds and said, Wayne, I don't think you heard us. Thank you very much for coming in. Please leave. So as I turned my back, like my good kind of sales training told me, try it three times, three times and then out. Whoa, guys, come on. What are you? You know, let's have a closer look at the way. Get out, and and, uh, and and off I went. That blue line, 
and that orange line are EasyJet and British Airways. That's the amount of landing. I couldn't find the actual data for this, so I apologize for that. But, these, but I found another chart, which was, which was very, very close to the chart that, that you would see today. These are the landing slots that each of these two airlines have out of Gatwick Airport. If I was to show you their web visits, it would, be, it would not be dissimilar over that period of time. 2003, I went to see them. What do you think happened in 2004? They called me. <laughs> Hi, guys. How you doing? Not so well. The, the, challenge, the challenge that they faced is the, uh, that they faced um, is the challenge that everyone faces with new technology. Um, is that it's there, but how do you harness it? How do you use it? So look, it's a really like it wasn't because they didn't buy my technology that, that British Airways has suffered this erosion in market share. It wasn't. It clearly wasn't that. But it was a culture and an attitude that um, persisted in that organization that presented themselves with those challenges. So when technology is there in front of you, please do your best to embrace it at the outset. If you aren't prepared to do that, don't get involved. There's still a challenge, and that challenge is, OK, if, if, I, have that, if I have that culture in my organization, um, it, is it really for me? How do I know that it's really going to work for how do I know it's really going to work for my events? I had that challenge as well. So about 15 months ago, I met Jeff, Pete, and Kevin. And uh, I was investing. So I, was, uh, I had exited a couple of businesses, and I wanted to invest in a couple of, in a couple of businesses. I spent some time on the west coast th of the US. And I was, um, I was interested in investing in businesses, and I saw a guidebook. Um, and I had the same kind of challenge. I was like, well, OK, it kind of makes sense. but does it? Because I don't have. I'm not from the events industry. If any of you hadn't figured that out, I'm, I'm not from. I'm not from this this sector. Um, but it kind of all made sense. So I thought, okay, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try it out. So there was an event. There was an event going on in my life. It had 70 attendees. 50% of the people had to fly to get there. 50% of them needed accommodation. 50% of them had never been to the location before. 50% could not speak the local language. Many people that were going to that event had never met before. 50% had smartphones. 50% would ask me lots of questions pre, during, and post the event. And I'm perceived to be technologically advanced amongst the people that were at that event. Any idea what event that was? Who said, who said what? Well done, that man. It was my wedding. So the event, the event was in the Czech Republic, my wife's Czech, um, and I wanted to create an app. So I did. It was a good way of me doing my due diligence. So when was the event? Where is it? How to get there? The accommodation, the dress code, the itinerary, what to do in the area, and the wedding list. I didn't want anyone to buy us presents, but there were people that said that they wanted to buy us presents. Uh, so I stuck it on the app and said, look, if you really want to buy us presents, it's there, it's there, it's on the app. It was a really kind of covert way of, of doing it. So I produced this app. I produ I, by the way, I am not a developer, I'm not an engineer, just to be really clear. You know, I'm a commercial guy, I build businesses. I had no help. During the event, guests were sharing their details. They were, um, uh, I was, you know, we were messaging to guests. Uh, a lot of that was pre-done. There was a Czech phrase book. They're in the Czech Republic. They want to, they want to interact with the locals. And there was photo sharing. Oh, and uh, yeah, some people enjoying the party as well. <laughs> After the event, guests continued to share details. There was feedback, uh, messages to to Hannah and I. Uh, there was more photo sharing uh, going on. People wanted to leave, obviously after the event. So the taxi numbers in there. My big question was. Did it work? So 100% of people downloaded it. So 100% of people that I, uh, that I expected to download it did download it. They had smartphones. I made them very aware. I did lots of stuff pre the event. Uh, and I was really forthright in my communication with them, which my wife was a little bit perturbed by. So if someone came to me with a question, my response would be, it's in the app. Um, 40 photos were shared. 50 contact cards were shared. But this last one, 
was the thing that justified it for me. There were over a thousand interactions on the app. Theoretically, those thousand interactions could have been questions to me. They weren't going to go to anyone else, and there was absolutely no way I was up for that. Um, and kind of the the the, uh, the great thing about it all is that it didn't cost me anything, and it wasn't because I was a potential investor in Guidebook. It was because it is just free to try it out. And that, for me, gave me the real justification to, um, to, to, to follow through because I knew, I knew it would work. So you, should, you, should, you, you can try it. You should try it. You should check it out for yourself um, before you invest too much. The second point in, in terms of deciding you know, which event app you should go with or whether you should have an event app is features. Last night in my hotel room, just off the top of my head, I rattled off these features. There were lots more. There are features, 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 features all over the place. Features are not an issue. If you want features, they are everywhere. The challenge with features is a little bit like the challenge with getting from A to B. Depending on what your racetrack or your event looks like, means that you're going to need slightly different features on the vehicle that's going to help you navigate around that event. So I'm using the racetrack or the road or the journey as an analogy for an event and the vehicle as the event app, the vehicle and its features. So for that racetrack, this car's pretty good. For this track, which is a country lane somewhere, probably in the United States, maybe the UK, Maybe this is a little bit more apt. A significantly different vehicle with significantly different features. For this, a road in London somewhere. Maybe this is, maybe this is the vehicle that gets you around. It certainly was for those two police, police people. And for this track, maybe it's this vehicle, a Scalectrix car. My point in all of this is, is that you must not be blinded by features. You, you are the experts at your event. You know what your event is about. You know how unique it is. You know the kind of vehicle stroke features that you're going to need to best interact with your audience. You must actively engage in what those features are that you require. Do not be blinded by the features. It's, it's a really easy tool for a salesperson. Look at this feature. Look at this latest feature we've got coming out. We've got, we've got Bluetooth eye beacons all over the place. OK, well, what are they going to do? How is that going to impact my event? Ask those questions. When you think features, you must think benefits. This vehicle is overloaded with features, but it's fine. It's going from A to B in an open desert. There is nothing in its way. Now, that is probably a pretty useful bit of kit for those people. Vendor choice. So you've pretty much got three options when it comes to, to choosing a, a vendor. The first is you can build it in-house. How many of you are prepared to build an event app in-house? Can I have a show of hands? It's a, it's a definite possibility. If you have the skills and you have the time, you absolutely should consider it. Build it yourself with a partner. So what that means is maybe someone can collaborate with you. Or let someone else completely build it for you. Those are your pretty, your pretty much your, excuse me, your three broad options. Some of the things you need to think about when it comes to options two or three. Pedigree. If you want a red sports car, and that is your description of a red sports car, you have to be really clear with the partner that that is what you want. This is not a joke. In terms of apps, I have seen when someone says, I want a red sports car and expect that car that you just saw, I have very commonly seen that. An app is not an app. An app is something that is created, that is designed, uh, that is hours are spent on ensuring that its usability is really, really good. We would hope that those of you that have the app today appreciate that the, the, uh, the ease of use and design uh, is something that we have toiled over. 
um, it's the s it's the same. Uh, it, it it really is the same across across all apps and websites. It's no different. People um <coughs> people at this point in time seem to think that an app is an app. It it really is not. Price transparency. We did some research. <coughs> we asked 528 um, event planners that had used an app <coughs> all sorts of questions, and one of them was, "What are your top challenges?" Budget came out on top. I think it's 40, 45 percent of those 520 people we asked in the U.S. and in the U.K. said budget was the biggest issue. Well, find a vendor that recognizes that budget is an issue and is open and upfront with you. Price transparency is a really big barrier when it comes to new technologies. I'm bored of technology companies saying, we're struggling to get traction, we're struggling for people to understand our tech, we're struggling for people to adopt our tech, when they're not clear about what it's going to cost them. The idea of, a, of putting you, the buyer, into a black box scenario, a black box scenario is a scenario whereby you don't know what's coming next, is something that I abhor. It's something that I've been part of in my past, and it just didn't work. It was a real struggle. It's not something that you should be subject to. So insist on price transparency. We go to the nth degree to provide you with price transparency. Go to our website. Right at the top, across the bar, there's a, there's a button that says pricing. Click on it. You'll get this. It's our prices. Ease of build. Some of you might be thinking, well, if I'm not going to build it, why do I care about how easy it is, gonna, it is to build? Build is really, really important. Why? Because somebody has to build it. And if it's not you, it's someone at the vendor. And what that means is, if something changes at an event, how do you know it's, and how confident are you it's going to be changed quickly in the way in which you need it? You need to understand how easy it is to build these things. So this is our back office. It, it kind of replicates the app. You can go in, you can use it, you can play around with it. You don't have to spend a penny. As I did for my wedding, you can build your own app. Go and play around with it. Go and try it. Price transparency and build transparency is a really important aspect of all of this. Ultimately, um, we are not going to be able to hold your hands at all of your events all over the world. You're going to want to take control yourselves. So find a platform that enables you and gives you confidence to have that control. Elegance and usability, we kind of touched on this. But what is a good app? A good app is what you think is a good app. You are absolutely qualified to determine what a good app is. Don't think for one minute that you're not. If you use apps, you are very well qualified to determine what a good app is. Use them, test them. It is amazing how many people will deploy an event app without having seen or used an event app from that vendor beforehand. It's astonishing. But it's not just in this industry. It's in many industries. They just trust. We as humans trust people. I'm not advocating that. I'm advocating do some more due diligence. This is the look and feel on an iPad, on two forms of an iPad. We make sure it looks uh, unique on those iPads. This is on BlackBerry. We spend time ensuring that the event app looks unique to the latest BlackBerry. This is on Android, left-hand nav. We have a team of people that focuses on ensuring the platform is optimized to Android. iPhone, we have a team of people that ensure it's optimized to iPhone. Our apps do not look the same by device because the devices are different. Invariably, the people that use the devices are also different. So why should the apps be the same? If you find a vendor that has the same design across all of those devices, big red flag. References. Look at these happy bunch of people. Whenever you ask for references from a vendor, this is what they present you. All of these great, beautiful, happy people. I'm going to do the same. It's pretty difficult to, to, to put you in front of this person who wasn't happy with the technology. It's actually a relatively difficult thing to do. But I've got some advice. Try and find them. How can you find them? Find the organization. Uh, or try, try and find an event that organization puts on where you can network with their clients as well as their prospects. And that's a very easy way to take someone aside and say, hey, you've been using Guidebook or whoever for a year or two. I know it's great. It can't be perfect. Tell me, tell me about the things that are imperfect. And maybe those things that are imperfect might be a deal breaker for you. Find them out. 
The thing that I love um, about technology is, is a little bit ironic, and, and, and it is that the people and the culture of the organization really are the key. Despite all the technology, it's the people behind the technology that drives that business that will ultimately drive your relationship and drive uh, the technology that you'll use. So find out about them. <coughs> These are some snapshots from uh, our office uh, in Palo Alto and <coughs> in San Francisco. <coughs> some people are working. Some people look like they're not working. They're just relaxing in between building your guides. Um, find out about the people. The people are really key in this whole process. So there are six, tr six, vendor, uh, six stages in, in terms of choosing a vendor. Pedigree, price transparency, ease of build, elegance and usability, references, and the key one at the end, people. Adoption. <coughs> so I'm going to speed through these last few slides. Um, adoption. Once you have gone through this process of determining that your culture is, is right for an event app, once you've gone through the process of determining the right features, once you've gone through the process of determining the vendor that you want to work with, or the technology platform that you want to work with, your job is just about to begin. This word, for, for all of you that like, fully appreciate English, and all of you that don't, is not a word. You do not automatically get people to use your app. It doesn't happen. Did everyone hear that? It does not happen. This is not a word. It's amazing how many people I speak with who really believe that is a word. They really believe that you can just deploy an app. And guess what? People will just be using it. It's crazy. I wish it was like that. Just to remind you, we're at the front end of this curve. If we were further down this curve, where it was pretty much done and we were all walking around with event apps, then you know, maybe that word automagically would exist. But today it doesn't. That word does not exist at this end of the evolutionary curve. Most uh, event planners will admit that they are not doing enough to market their apps. And you know, vendors should be there to help. Uh, we certainly do our bit, we believe, to, to help. Um, in terms of adoption, going back to that research that we did, um, it seems that the sweet spot is, in terms of download, these are, these are download accepts. So people believe that if they get to 50% download rate, 25% um, of people will believe that's good for their, for their ROI. So the, the sweet spot is if they get somewhere between 30 and 70% download in terms of an event, they'll be pretty happy that it's going to get them the ROI that they are looking for. We see... Uh, we see lots of people get over 100%. You get over 100% by multiple downloads and by people downloading the app that aren't at the event. I'm more than happy to talk with you offline about how, how we would do that. So here are some basics um, in terms of adoption. The app needs to be the source of the majority of the content for the event. Critical information needs to be in the app. People need to be able to turn to it. There needs to be exclusive content in the app. So we have, a, we have a, a prize function in the app for this event. I'm sure most of you are going to try and download the app and try and win those great prizes that the team have put on here. And make the app interactive. Of course, we've had a little bit of trouble here with Wi-Fi. It helps when there is really solid Wi-Fi. And if there are interactive polls and you were, and you were encouraged to use the app to interact with the speaker and so on and so forth, that, w that is also really, um, really key. But the big one um, beyond all of that it's just promotion. So you can see these posters around the way on these doors. The guy's done a great job of that. There is a, there's a web version. So every single guidebook app that we produce, there is a web version. Release it early. Give people access to this so they can interact with the event from their desktops, not just from their devices. Email templates, all pre-produced in our back office. You don't need to lift a finger if you don't want to. You can just go in and adapt it if you wish. Landing page. So direct people to this landing page via Twitter, via all the social media, and via email. And you'll probably be on your way. The final point is data. Now, this is a pretty big one. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I'm hoping my point's going to be pretty clear. Hands up who agrees with that statement. 
Yeah, so it's great that half of you agree with that statement. The, the half of you that don't, um, I kind of understand why you didn't put your hand up. I would also argue that the, the half of you that put your hand up want to believe it, but really struggle with it. Um, it's a really common, f uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, failure is something that is applauded. But there is this undercurrent of, oh, yeah, but, you know, there are conditions. And there really are conditions to failure. And the big one is that you learn and evolve from it. The great thing about having an event app is the underlying data is this safety net for failure. It's almost impossible to fail if you have this wealth of data that underlies your event app. And the reason why is that that data is your, is your direction to evolution. And without that direction to evolution, you absolutely can't evolve. So failing without that data is a really big issue. But if you fail with the underlying insights as to what is going on at your event, you do not have a problem because you can analyze the data and you can evolve. So you know, what was my download rate like in the run-up to the event? What were the things that worked? What, what were the things that didn't? What, you know, how many downloads did I get by device? What were, the, what were the main things that people were looking at and using within my, within my event app at my event? <coughs> so in summary, th these are the five key, th five key takeaways that I'm going to leave with you that will hopefully help you em empower yourself when it comes to determining what event technology you you utilize, especially across apps. So do you need an app? What's our culture? And test it. It's pretty easy to test. Features, features, features. Features are fine. But think, what are the benefits to my event of having certain features? The vendor. What's their heritage? How transparent are they? And what are their people like? Adoption. Automagically is not a word. And data. Data is a beautiful thing. Don't be afraid of it. Accept it. Accept that it enables you to fail easily and allows you to derive insights that drive evolution. So, final stat. When we asked all of these people, uh, in, in these 528 people, what were the thing, what was the one thing that um, gave them a great event, it was 86% of them said if, they, if their attendees were satisfied, their event was a success. I think most of you would agree with that. 88% um, of those people said that an event app had a positive effect upon attendee satisfaction. So there is an inextricable link between executing well against an event app and driving that core metric, which is attendee satisfaction. So if you get it right, it can really, um, really push your event to the next level. And ultimately, there are no excuses. Because apart from your time, it's free. So you should definitely give it a go. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions if any of you have any questions. There's always questions. The first one's the toughest. Hello. I want just to ask if we use application like this and technology like this, for example, here in Bulgaria, maybe we develop a little bit slower, but uh, if we use this, how many, should we exclude the paper-based things and all the other stuff, and how many percentage should we put on this technology? And because some of the people maybe they, they don't use phones, so how can we sure. put it in percentage? Thank you. Yeah, you have to know your audience. So if your audience um, doesn't have smart devices, then it's really difficult for them to interact. It's impossible, right? If they if they just if they have a traditional old style phone, then they're they're not going to be able to interact. If they don't have iPads, they're not going to be able to interact. And th and the real value is interaction at the event. So, 
Well, I would say, like, at my wedding, half of the people had those really cool old-school Nokias, you know, and I was s stealing them to play the snake o o on it, yeah? So they weren't using the app, but half of the guests were, and that was good enough for me. My key there was I wanted to get half of those people to use it because I, I thought if, if less than half of them were using it, it wouldn't have been a great result. So going back to that research that we did, it's somewhere between 30 and 70% adoption drives the positive ROI that people are looking for. So if you think you can get 30, somewhere between 30 and 70% of the people downloading the app, then you've probably done a good enough job to justify having it based on the research. If it's going to be less than 30% of people that essentially have a smart device that they can use the app on, then maybe your event isn't, isn't quite ready for an app. Uh, quick question. Uh, today, when we downloaded the app, uh, we, were, we also received an email saying uh, we have to print uh, hard copy, uh, basically paper. Does the app support uh, barcode uh, within the app itself? So while we enter an event, they can scan the, the code of the smart device instead of having a hard copy paper. So specifically with guidebook, the answer to that is yes through a web link. So any of the, um, any of the icons that you have within your app can be a web link, which essentially means it's not native to the app, but it links out to a barcode scanner or, or, or any other kind of device that you might want. So that could, that is absolutely possible. It's not native within the app, which is a bit, is a little bit technical uh, of, of an answer, but the answer is yes through a web link. So as long as there is Wi-Fi, we would be able to do barcode scanning, QR code. In fact, there's an inbuilt QR code. So there's an inbuilt QR code scanner in that app, but there is not an inbuilt barcode scanner. So we would need to leverage a secondary barcode that. scanner, which we would do through a web link in the app. Thank you. Any more questions? Wayne, thank you very much indeed. Round of applause thank for you. Wayne Morris. Thank you. Good job. Okay, we're now going to take a lunch break, obviously. The gold pass holders and speakers should go to the seventh floor for their lunch. Uh, there are two restaurants downstairs for all other guests to attend, so gold pass holders and speakers, seventh floor, um, two restaurants downstairs for all other guests. We're going to resume at 13.45, at quarter to two, so I will see you back in here at 13.45 sharp. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>